there's something about this place. It's, it's, it's almost like the California of the past, but it's also the California of the future. But the land is a character in the story. It's a force in the story. And it has influenced people. But it's also made it very difficult to tell the story. The, the Indians that lived in this area, that lived in this watershed, um, name that I think we mostly use now is Rumsian, um, and, and they had had three to four thousand years to figure the place out. So they knew the place better than anyone ever did or ever has or ever will. This becomes a wonderful multicultural sort of pocket. Um, we've got a Chinese fishing village over at Point Lobos. We've got Azorean whalers at Point Lobos, Portuguese. We've got Californios living here. We've got Indians still living here, by, this is, say, by 1850. Um, I mean, everybody was here, and they got along. My family um, came originally from Kentucky into Monterey County, into California in the late 1840s, and then moved to Monterey County and bought property in 1853. Originally, uh, they raised uh, sheep and cattle. As a matter of fact, I have a, um, I have a blanket that my great-great-grandmother raised the sheep, sheared the sheep, carded the wool, dyed the wool, and wove the blanket. You know, no matter how bad other things get in my life, I mean, I thank my lucky stars every day that I not only live here, but that I have roots here, that I really feel my roots go deep in this, in this county. Uh, I think it's time to pay tribute to family history in the land. Uh, this land gave my parents the opportunity to provide for their family and dream of a better tomorrow. My inheritance is not tangible. It's their sense of perseverance, their sense of commitment, and their sense of responsibility. The story is that my father came to this country in 1945 from central Mexico, Guanajuato, Mexico, with no formal education, no English skills, no money, and his only knowledge and his only tools were his arms to work the land. And so he came here trying to apply those same tools to better himself and his family. And so I think that my father and my mother, my whole family has really tried to be gracious, careful, and uh, accommodating to the land throughout their lives. It's given our family uh, our well-being and our ability to sustain ourselves financially and uh, really gave us uh, a door in terms of future opportunities. And I think that that continues to be the case. Uh, I think that the, the sense of responsibility towards the land has endured. Oh, this is California, 38 million people live here. You know, how, why is it so rural? How did you pull this off? And, and I always say this didn't just happen. It happened because people cared and people fought to protect those lands. I remember being very curious about living things. And of course, when, you, when you're curious about things, uh, you tend to want to take them apart to see how they work. My mother was very proud of her tulips and she had a whole bed of these expensive tulips. So I started taking them apart to sort of see what parts are in there. And of course my mother came out and was de devastated because here's her child destroying, in her view, her beautiful tulips. And she laughed after telling me to stop and uh, she came back a few minutes later to find that I was trying to put them back together. And I think that there's this sort of passionate feeling of of trying to repair the harm you may have even inadvertently done um, that is probably still driving me to, to pick up litter or to, or to do the plant restoration or do the, in, the, the trials of different grasses and things for restoration um, in, in an effort to sort of see what 
goes together and how to put it back together if we've accidentally taken it apart. This county has such remarkable resources and we really need to just all keep our eye, our eye on the ball of the long-term um, vision that it's really our generation's responsibility to ensure they're here for the future. My family has a very deeply held land stewardship ethic which came from my father. He had a very strong connection to the land and he really um, instilled that in us because we all spent a lot of time on the land. Just think about a child picking up a lizard and touching it for the first time and being gentle. There's something very spiritual. And what I find is that the children that we serve are living in very compacted areas. We know we have to work with the whole child, the mind, the body, and their soul. And being out in nature gives them that opportunity to touch each and every one of those areas. Turkey tracks right here. We did a work project. We removed French broom um, from along the, the creek bed here, which is a non-native invasive species. So we took about a half hour and um, and ripped that up. Um, the kids really showed a lot of teamwork, I thought, and, and it went really well. That was easy. Yeah. You come out here and even with the school, still have fun. I mean, when you're back at the school, it's like sit down, do your work, stay in class. To drag. But when you come out here, it's wonderful. It's peaceful. It's, it's just everything's best. I think it's important to have more programs that are integrated, um, where they're going out on a regular basis and it becomes more a part of their regular life and their regular experience. You get to see little glimmers of hope. Serendipityville is my dream for the future. <laughs> I would love to have a place where people could come and learn about farming and bring the kids and have classes on nutrition and growing and planting and harvesting and taking care of the crops. Just a whole place where everybody, oh, the community could be involved. Taking part in that and feeling like it's their farm and their community. We got pumpkins. Yeah, we'll walk out in the pumpkin patch. I think that if we all understand that the community is with a capital C and that really we're not that disconnected from people who may be not in close physical proximity to us because we're all working under the same umbrella called the planet, that it makes it very logical to help other communities work with the land to protect our place of being. My deepest immediate concern is that uh, ranchers aren't going to be there next generation. Uh, and that uh, indigenous wisdom, that indigenous knowledge about how to live on the land um, will be gone. What my dad had asked me to do in about 1997 was to hopefully we'd get this place set up so it would always be a ranch, that it wouldn't go into housing development, and um, that it'd be a place for the family to gather for as many generations as they wanted to. Started as a a uh, young man working uh, with my father. Uh, 
uh, growing crops is come, becoming increasingly more expensive, whether it be uh, government regulation or you know farmland uh, being put out of production or those kind of things. Uh, you know, we, we not only compete amongst ourselves here in the valley, but we uh, compete statewide, nationally, we compete on a global uh, basis. My dream or vision uh, would be that we have a, uh, a wonderful and uh, vibrant uh, ag industry, a, a beautiful uh, area for all to enjoy, and we can continue to provide the healthy foods that, uh, that can feed the country and, uh, and beyond. If we can allow environmentally wise ranchers to bring in their herds to do the appropriate grazing to conserve the land, then again, that's a win-win situation. The land is being conserved with a good scientific perspective, but, it's, but it also contributes to the area's economy. The families that live on these lands, we're just like every other family. We're just like the family that lives right down in the middle of the city. We have the same uh, same things happen to us. You know, there's people that are born, people that die. There's the same type of problems. There's the same type of joys. Um, we have similar needs. Um, you don't have to live in a place like this to, to appreciate it. You can be in the valley and have an opportunity to come out here or a place to or an opportunity just to observe it from a distance and know that that's where your water's coming from, that there's pigs and deer and condors and blue jays. And the people that live in the cities are as important to what happens here as the people on the land are. No one can own all of this land and uh, that's probably a really good thing. <laughs> But there can be a challenge to all interested parties to a continue to learn and, and approach this approach this enterprise of caring for the land of stewardship with uh, what I would call um, a required humility. You know, no one knows it all, and no one ever will. And with that humility, we can we we can sort of uh, assume that we may not have all the answers and we may need to um, be open to um, other people's wisdom. When I came through Big Sur um, 36 years ago on a business trip with a coat and tie and a rented car, I uh, experienced something that uh, caught me and uh, brought me back. And that feeling is still there. But ultimately, it just makes me feel good. And uh, it makes uh, me feel good to come back if I go away. There's something about that um, confluence of mountain and sea that just makes you feel good. I would see people coming here and just their jaws would drop. They would look south and they'd see this incredible view. And it wasn't just that it was beautiful, it was like it moved them into some place in themselves that was more true than anything else. And that's what I wanted to be able to do as an artist, is to move people into that true center. My biggest dream is that we have more people of all groups dreaming about possibilities. We need to be crazy, we need to dream about what this county's potential is. I want dreamers to come together and paint a really cool picture. <laughs> um, not everybody can live here, but those that do seem to find a way to get balance. Time to gather and time to recreate, and time to appreciate just what a, what a country we live in. <laughs> <laughs>